What's up? Welcome to the Confluence VC podcast. This podcast is meant to give you a personal glimpse into the next era of investors and operators. All right, this week we had on Matt Knight, who's the founder of PropTech Angel Group. PropTech Angel Group is an angel group out of Atlanta that, as the name suggests, invests in a company shaping the future of real estate. The group's been around for a few years. It's grown to 200 members, and Matt's the founder and leader of that group. We actually met up the other week when he was in town. Great guy to know, especially if you invest into PropTech yourself. In this talk, we cover running an angel group versus running a traditional fund, subsectors of PropTech worth betting on, and non-obvious takeaways from growing a paid community to 200 members. All right, cool, Matt. So I'd like to start these talks, just learning a little bit more about you and your path. So with that, who is Matt Knight? How'd you get to where you are today? Yeah, a bit unconventional, and I appreciate you having me on. I, I come from private equity real estate, where I managed a few hundred million for a PE firm in the last recession. And that was a lot of fun managing distressed deals and doing real estate private equity. And then I left in 2013 with a high net worth guy buying real estate in the Sun Belt, like uh, Virginia to Arizona, basically, and just saw that tech was a lever we could pull in real estate that for some reason nobody wanted to pull in 2013. Everybody wanted cheaper capital and more deals. So I started a venture firm with a partner and we built up uh, an incubator with WeWork. We built an accelerator with a few other firms and just had an whole ecosystem and left that in 2019 and accidentally started the largest angel group in the world around prop tech. And I'm still running that to this day until somebody makes me grow up. That's what, that's what I do. <laughs> awesome. Uh, let's jump into that a little bit more. So prop tech angel group, you said it started in 2019. So give us the elevator pitch on that, how it was formed. And I mean, as the name suggests, you guys obviously invest in prop tech, but I'm sure there's like a lot more to unpack there. Yes, we spent lots of time on the name of our of our company. It's just been a <laughs> lift. Uh, but yeah, it, it started off with like, I thought, I know all these people in real estate because that's my career. I know a lot of prop tech founders. I'll just connect them. And a few of my friends said, hey, when you find one you like, I'll invest, I'll invest with you. I said, okay. And then all of a sudden I turn around, we have 10 people and then we have 20 people and then we have 50 people. And I said, okay, all right, we got to, we have to formalize this. This needs to be a little more organized. And so we have Zoom calls and meetings and happy hours and uh, Google Drive and Slack channels and sort of learn from people like Hyde Park Angels and Gotham Angels and Karetsu and a lot of people who found success in the angel game before. And so now they're just under 200 members, which is a lot of fun. And it's evolved as much into like a YPO for PropTech. If you know YPO, it's more like that than it is how many deals can we do per year? Because sometimes it's just helpful to have peers in a safe place to talk about things you can't talk about on stage or on Twitter. And so it's great to have that network of people where we can sort of talk inside baseball uh, and do some deals as well. So that's sort of uh, how it evolved from the beginning. And how many members do you guys have right now? Just under 200, something like 185, 190, something like that. I haven't checked today, but it's just under 200. Nice. And the majority of the work you do with that group, is it online, in person, mix of the two? Well, uh, I think last year that answer would have been different than it is this year because last year we couldn't go anywhere. So it started online um, and I'd say we have probably 10 in-person events a year. And so we're mostly, mostly online. Nice. Good stuff. What are some of the pros and cons of running an angel group? Like, I mean, I'm sure you're aware like most of the people we talk to are running traditional funds. I've heard all their pros and cons, but like, I don't have an inside scoop on like what actually goes on behind the scenes of running an angel group. I, it's it's exactly what you would assume. It's that we're just slow because half of my members are running prop tech companies. And so the startup founders aren't known for having free time. And so when I come up with a deal or something I need help on, we got to go sort of herd cats and get people uh, involved and in getting to fill out their docs and, you know, saying I'll be in and just even committing verbally. So we just tend to be slower than I want, but that's fine. I'm sure you know, that's, we try to articulate that up front with founders. 
But I think the beauty is we can sort of do whatever we want. Again, I've run a fund, I've built PPMs, like I'm familiar with the uh, very LP friendly language that your their lawyers put in there. And so if we want to go invest in a fund, we can do a fund. If we want to do a secondary transaction, we can do a second. We want to invest in a company out of Acapulco or Tangiers, we can do that if we want to. And so we are very, very flexible with what we want to do uh, and just sort of do whatever makes sense. And we have enough willing adults to do, we do. So it's, it's the two-sided coin of not a lot of structure is, is a bit of an impediment for our speed, but it's also very uh, conducive to flexibility. Is the biggest bottleneck, like with your, your time, like I'm assuming just like writing memos, are you doing most of that yourself? Or are you hiring or like outsourcing that to anybody right now? I have, I have an analyst. I have an analyst that does a good job okay. with our memo. Nice. Nice. How do you kind of manage going off script here, but like, how do you kind of manage the different LP preferences? Cause I'm sure like running a group of 185 plus people, like all of them have different stuff that's interesting to them. Do you kind of just do it on like a deal by deal basis or do you prioritize like certain things? Yeah. What I do is I send out a weekly email with all of our deals for the week. Cause we'll see somewhere between four and 10 deals a week and I'll summarize them and give them all the info on it. So like I'll have, here's the deal. Here's a summary. Here's a link to their website. Here's a one pager we did on it. Here's their deck and here's the founder, right? So all the information I have now you have. And so you do you sort of choose your own adventure. You want to dig into apartment tech, go, go nuts. You want to dig into blockchain and tokenization of real estate, you go crazy, right? And then when we have our calls every other week, I'll sort of highlight a few that I think are interesting and let other members do the same. And so through that process, we sort of bubble up like, oh, six, seven people asked about this one. This one seems to be getting a lot of interest. Let's dig into that, right? And so I'm not, crowdsourcing is probably the wrong word, but I allow people to sort of dig into what they like and then surface it on our calls. And so that's sort of, I don't have to keep up with, to your point, 185 different risk profiles and whose daughter's getting married and someone's selling their company. You know, you figure that out. Just tell me when you're interested in something and when there are enough people, we'll put together a little syndicate. Yeah, that makes sense. So we talked about this the other week when you're in town, but you're an example of somebody that's quietly built a growing private community. Um, I feel like I've taken notes from a lot of people that are like a lot more public. Um, but what are some things that you've learned about community building along the way since doing this for the last three years that maybe weren't obvious to you at first when you just started out? Yeah, I think one of the things is to know something academically and then know something practically, right? Like I've been, I, 15 years ago, read Tim Ferriss and learned about Pareto principle and the 80, 20, like I knew that academically, but when you see it in a group, like who are the 20% of my members that are on every call and do every deal and are really in sort of a, sort of a tangent to Kevin Kelly's thousand true fans theory. Like it's that concept is there's 20, 30, 40 people in my group that are just all over it, right? They're really, really bought in. And so I would say in practice, I knew that would be the case in theory. Who are they? What do they look like? Where do they come from? How do I find them? That's been much more of a learning curve and been super interesting and sort of non-intuitive. It's not as obvious as I thought it would be. Yeah, couldn't agree more. I feel like finding them, especially like, I don't know, there's not like we found there isn't a great way to identify those people. It's all just kind of like anecdotal. It's like, oh, like I keep seeing this person's yeah. name around. Like they've got kissing it. frogs. You just got to kiss frogs until you find yeah. out who the princes are. Like there's no, I wish there were a shortcut, but I don't think there is. Yeah, no like deep analytics to be like, oh yeah, this person engaged. Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. So like switching gears again to prop tech world, I'm assuming the last two to three years have created a bunch of changes. Like I'm not a real estate guy. My, my brother is, I'm not, but how has real estate changed over those last two to three years, but like more specifically how have real estate priorities changed since 2020 and how have those affected the companies you choose to invest in? It's, it's a hard question because when you ask about real estate, it's sort of like asking about money, like, well, which part are you talking about, right? Because real estate is such a massive industry that, so for instance, office, neither of us is sitting in an office building right now. Two years ago, that probably would have been different, right? So office is having lots of problems. Industrial, you know, with Amazon and Shopify and Walmart, industrial is killing it, right? Multifamilies got its own issues right now. They're skewing more hospitality, but 
you know, writ large in real estate, what's happened, especially this year is, you know, debt financing is dried up. And so there's not as many transactions. And so that sort of shows how landlords, which is how I define prop tech as tech that you sell to people that own buildings, how landlords shift their priorities. And what I've learned is over time, like when you're in a, when you're in an up cycle, everyone wants tech that helps them grow and optimize revenue, right? When you start hitting a down cycle, it's like, you know, maybe we should trim expenses. Maybe we should look at our water and power bill, right? And so those things that are a little more OPEX, CAPEX become a little more interesting. And so real estate writ large, I would say, is having a capital markets issue right now. And so we're seeing more interest in fintech and more interest in companies that will save them money on their operations versus just how do I buy more buildings or how do I build more buildings? That's not as, that's not in the cards anymore. And so how do you, how do you revitalize the portfolio you currently have? That's interesting. That makes a ton of sense. I mean, I obviously don't have real estate mind, but I mean, I'm just like seeing interest rates rise, like not seeing like a whole lot of people buy more buildings just because it's become more expensive too. So like best way to increase rent on any of those, just like validate the reason for that, which is like improving internal operations. So that makes sense. Um, I guess related to that, what are three subsectors of prop tech that are most interesting to you and why right now? I'd say FinTech is super interesting because partially because of what I just said, because there's so many problems in capital markets that having a better tech stack to handle that makes you more efficient than the guy down the street that's competing against you or the gal across town that's competing against you. So FinTech is such a mature part of the tech ecosystem, especially in the past 10 years. FinTech is really interesting, how you handle your mortgage, how you handle your equity, uh, because you know, the biggest expense or, or I guess the biggest investments any of us ever make generally is our house and our biggest expense monthly, if you're not a homeowner, is your rent. And so it, FinTech is gonna come into real estate and since it's the largest asset class in the world, you know, FinTech is really a growing part of what we do. So I would say that's one. The other one is just apartment multifamily tech is becoming much more like hospitality, a lot more to your point, how do I throw amenities at renters to get them to lease my apartments instead of the one across the street that's the same age with the same, with the same aspects. So multifamilies really become a burgeoning subsector of what we do since especially Gen Y and Gen Z are not buying houses. So a lot of consumer brands are saying, how do I sell Tide Pods if you're not buying a house? How, how do I sell them through your apartment landlord? So that's pretty interesting. And then I think the third would be affordability. Just housing is so sort of universally unaffordable out in the major cities in the world that how do we find tech like 3D printing and financial services and financial engineering? How do we find, how do we build buildings cheaper so we can pass on the cost savings to our, our buyers or our renters? Uh, you know, I think in affordability and housing is really a long-term macro trend that we've, we've seen really explode recently. What are your... I guess, five-year thoughts on like the last two points you just mentioned on like the fact that people my age aren't buying houses or like priced out of houses in major areas. Like, do you see a, a or an exodus from major cities? Do you see like, or do you think people are just going to be competent uh, or complacent renting their whole life? Like, how are you kind of seeing the world? No. I don't see, let me take pieces of that. I don't see an exodus from major cities. I don't see that because the reason you and I could meet in Austin last week is because yeah. I was in Austin and you were like, there's a lot of people to meet in Austin. So I don't see that. Um, do I see longer term renters for sure? Um, and I also see people opting into it regardless of cost, because for me, even with my house that I own, and I got to go fix the gutters and there's something wrong with my electrical and another HVAC thing copped up. I don't want to fool with it, right? Like I have young kids, like I don't want to do that, right? And so having a super or landlord that'll do it for me is pretty appealing if I get the square footage and the location I need, right? And so I think there are people that will perpetually rent, rent regardless of their income and the affordability of the housing because it's just more convenient and they don't want to spend their hours fiddling with their house. That's not the highest and best use of their time in their early to peak earning years, you know? And so I'm actually seeing a lot of people starting companies around that for homeowners saying, we will be your home maintenance and management portal. We'll send someone out every month to fix light bulbs and small broken wiring things and check your plumbing and we'll change your air filters every quarter. I, I would gladly pay for that 
and I'm not even their target demographic. So I would say a home ownership in in and of itself is sort of coming into question for these next couple of generations from what I can tell. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I've seen a couple of companies pop up where like one that I looked at the other day uh, might've been because they raised money. They were trying to help people build up credit through renting, especially as like credit or as uh, the renting timeline expands. Um, Like you don't want to just be burning that money. Like you want to use that to like build up credit. So then whenever time comes that you are ready to buy a house or it becomes affordable and like, okay, like credit score is good. Um, I'm sure there's like a lot of opportunity as that trend plays out, just like more renting or like longer renting for people my age. I've just, I haven't really unpacked it myself, but I'm not in a position to buy a house yet. So one of the interesting ones is a few companies are having basically like 401k equivalents where they will start putting money towards a down payment for a house for you. Right. Because it's becoming so expensive. They'll do employer matching. And so that's been an interesting uh, trend as people sort of hold on to this. Everyone wants to buy a house. So let's help young people do it. If that ends up playing out, that's an interesting, at least corporate trend from what I've seen. How would that work if they like, I'm just thinking like, especially with my generation, like people just switch jobs like every two to three years. Like what happens? Well, how does your 401k roll over, right? Like it's, it's, it's a financial instrument that you can roll with you where you go. Yeah, it's valid. That is interesting. Oh, I haven't heard about that. I guess it makes sense though, just given the current environment. Affordability, man. It's a yeah, For real. Uh, well, cool. You want to jump into quick fire? Do it. I'm ready. Sweet. We got five questions, all meant to be answered in two sentences or less. First one we got is what is a recommendation you hear regularly that you think is bad advice? In venture, there's a lot of like product led growth uh, advice around that. And I think it misleads some people in my industry where you think the product will sort of sell itself. It will not in prop tech. You, you have to go to where the, where the real estate people are. Totally. It's like, it's always fun. I mean, like I love product like growth companies, but it's so funny to see companies that just like buck that trend, like bill.com as an example, like their UI is horrendous and they just continue to grow month over month by just having like a very sticky product that meets people where they are. And solve Uh, a real problem. Solve a real problem. Yeah. (laughs) That should be priority number one. Uh, in the last year, what new belief behavior habit has most improved your life? Uh, getting to inbox zero every day has been pretty awesome where there's just so much less of a cloud over my head at night and in the morning is I don't get to zero every day, but I get under five every day. And that's pretty good. Use superhuman or something to to help you with that. or just have superhuman, but I haven't needed it. There are enough shortcuts on my keyboard for Gmail that I've been able to do it without superhuman so far. Nice. What is one piece of advice you'd give to somebody starting a company today? It is difficult in in prop tech, I assume it is difficult to over discover your customers uh, in my space. Too many, the mistakes I see are tech people coming in thinking that the tech will sell itself if I build awesome tech and it won't. And then real estate people coming in saying, I know real estate and I'll just build the tech when I, you know, whenever I figure it out and it won't. Right. So both sides sort of underestimate the other. This is an incredibly insular business. So uh, getting to know your customer is rarely ever a waste of your time are most of the successful prop tech companies are they people within the i'm assuming they're people that have lived within the real estate world first rather than like live in the tech world and enter into prop tech am i right in that most is a strong word but it's so incestuous and familial in real estate that they ever go golf everybody all golfs together and if you're not in that little group of people it's very very hard to break in nobody they've never heard of Andreessen Horowitz so like you showing up with a sexy VC business card means nothing to them so it's um those I think what you're getting at is do those relationships existing matter they absolutely do right over time if you're I mean if the Collison brothers brought something in they'd be fine right but you're not the Collison brothers and neither am I so like it's you you have to be generational to buck that trend and Most of us aren't. Yeah, checks out. What's something you believe that most other people don't? Um, I would say that 
prop tech is now what fintech was five years ago, is the, the world's largest asset class that touches everybody. You and I are both sitting in buildings. Everybody who ever listens to this is probably sitting in a building and maybe you're on the train somewhere, but you're in a building, right? The, the energy that's powering the Wi-Fi for you to watch this is prop tech, right? So I think most people underestimate how massive this market is. People say, oh, that's a cute little niche. We'll put it under our, you know, fintech arm. And it's like, okay, I think you're, I think you're underestimating it, but that's one thing I believe most people don't. Yeah, I agree. I wish I was just had a deeper knowledge in it, but I agree. It's like overwhelming how large it is. If you had one ask for our listeners, what would it be? Treat your, because I assume most of these are VCs if it's on your, your, your podcast. I would say treat your founders as if they are people, as we all get obsessed with metrics and KPIs and markups and look how my portfolio is doing. And we think of our founders sometimes as ARR machines, and they have lives and hobbies and breaking points and stresses that uh, we could all be slightly more empathetic towards. So think of your founders as people and treat them that way and they will, they will be loyal to you. Yeah. It's crazy how that wins friends, just not treat them like a cog in the machine. And if I can be helpful on prop tech, you know, real estate dorks that want to talk about tech or prop tech founders that want to talk to somebody. I'm always, I'm always down to chat with those people. Yeah. We'll, we'll link everything in, uh, in the podcast and newsletter, try to make it as easy as possible for people to find you. Cause I, um, I'm probably not the best person for you to talk with. There's probably people with a lot deeper questions than like <laughs> some of the ones I just toss up to you, but if anybody's listening, reach out to Matt. He's the guy to know within PropTech. I am highly reachable and I'm on the Slack channel. So I'm yeah, in you Slack know. based in Atlanta. If anybody's in, in the Southeast. They're not. <laughs> probably not. <laughs> no here. That's all right. They're probably not. But well, cool, man. This has been fun. I uh, I appreciate you hopping on. I'm happy to do it. Thanks for inviting me, man. I appreciate it. Keep up the great work. You guys are building something cool. I appreciate it. It's been awesome. All right, buddy. Enjoy your day. Thanks, man. Yeah. Later. Huge thanks to Matt for coming on this week. We hope that each of you are able to pick up something valuable from this talk. If you're looking to get in touch with Matt, as always, link the social description for him below. And if you're looking to get in touch with PropTech Angel Group, we've also linked their website below as well. For next steps, if each of you have not submitted your info to become a member yet you can do that through our website at www.confluence.bc and also if you want to become a subscriber to the newsletter we offer a ton of free resources in there each and every week meant to help you become better at your individual roles you can subscribe there at www.confluence.substack.com hope that helps hope to hear from y'all soon